To begin, let us acknowledge that Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We are grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. We thank the Indigenous peoples of this area for the care of this land for thousands of years, and we hope to honor and respect them as we hold our virtual event today. I'd also like to take a moment to personally thank everyone for joining our presentation today. Our speaker this afternoon is Damian Bourne, who will be presenting on morphometric and genetic variation in exotid ticks at an expanding range edge. Damian is a first year Master of Science student at Queen's University under the Department of Bio Biology. His research focuses on understanding the molecular and population genetics of ticks within Eastern Ontario. Through the use of genotyping in thousands by sequencing and high throughput sequencing, he hopes to better understand tick species diversity and population dynamics. We will have Damien present for about 20 minutes and then we will open for questions from the audience. You can ask your questions by entering your questions in the chat box, raising your hand icon, uh, or if time allows, unmuting and asking your question directly. Please help us welcome Damien to the podium. Thank you very much. I'm just gonna share my screen. We can see it good. Okay, perfect. So I'll get started. So hello everybody and thank you for attending my talk about my master's thesis. The current title is Morphometric and Genomic Variation in Exoded Text at an Expanding Range Edge. So in this presentation, we will first discuss some background information that are important to my research. We will go through my research questions and how they will be addressed through my methodology. We will also explore some current morphometric results and discuss the next steps I plan to take with the genetic data. So to begin, I want to give a brief overview of zoonosis, and zoonotic diseases are infectious diseases caused by a pathogen that has jumped from a non-human animal to a human. More than 60% of human infectious diseases are caused by pathogens shared with wild or domestic animals. It is essential to understand the biology of zoonotic disease in order to develop protocols for mitigation, prevention, and response to such pandemics when they occur. As we can see from this diagram, zoonotic diseases come in a wide variety of vectors, ultimately impacting human health and well-being. And as we all know, one of these important vectors happens to be ticks. Ticks are considered to be second worldwide to mosquitoes as vectors of human diseases, but they are considered to be the most important vectors of disease causing pathogens in domestic and wild animals. Some examples of tick-borne diseases include Rocky Mountain spotted fever, relapsing fever, Lawson virus, and the more well-known Lyme disease. So ticks find their hosts through a behavior known as questing. This is when the tick climbs up a long piece of grass or other foliage and reaches out waiting for possible hosts to pass by. Although questing behavior may look the same, different species have different cues to let them know when a potential host has passed by. For example, a deer tick will grab onto almost anything, However, other species may have hormonal or chemical cues for host selection. Once the tick has grabbed onto a host, it may take hours for them to find an optimal feeding site. Feeding locations usually include areas of the body that are hard to see, such as armpits, belly buttons, and behind your knee. And although having a tick on you seems frightening enough, the real danger occurs once they attach. So after a suitable site has been found, the tick inserts its feeding tube and then injects its saliva and other bodily fluids such as anesthetic. Within this mixture of bodily fluids, we find various bacteria, viruses, and protozoans that are responsible for disease. The collection of microbes is known as the tick microbiome, and it can vary depending on the species. So this is the tick life cycle for Exodes pacificus, which can be found across Western Canada. Although tick life cycles are species dependent, they are, there are some commonalities. Their life cycles begin as eggs that hatch into larvae. These larvae go on to find their first host, which can be a wide variety of taxa, including small mammals, birds, and lizards. During their first blood meal, harmful microbes can be taken up by the ticks. Some pathogens are horizontally transferred between the tick vector and an infected host. However, this is not the only way that a tick can become infected. Some species contain microbes that are vertically transferred between parent and offspring. So the high diversity in tick microbiome across species is truly staggering. There are many species present in Eastern Ontario, 
The most known of these include Dermacanthus variabilis, also known as the American dog tick, and Exodus scapularis, also known as the black-legged deer tick. However, diversity in these species uh, diversity in the species present is truly staggering, and species that are not currently observed in eastern Ontario are migrating northward into Canada if they are not already present. Species of special concern include Haemophilus longicornis, the Asian longhorn tick, and Abeloma americanum, or the lone star tick. Each of these species contains unique microbiomes and behaviors, ultimately leading them to have different pathogens. It has been observed that members of the same species can form genetically distinct subpopulations based on host feeding preference, which confounds issues when it comes to disease prevention and mitigation. However, a lack of morphological differences makes them extremely hard to identify. It may be easy to identify differences at the genus level, such as those present within the di this diagram, but when you get down to the species level, it gets incredibly difficult. Additionally, hybridization has been observed within both the Dermacanter and Exodes genus, further, comp co uh, further comp complicating taxonomic identification. So here we have an example of the high resolution photographs that are needed to identify specimens at the species level. On the top, we have ex an Exodes scapularis tick and an Exodes affinis on the bottom. We're able to see slight differences between them, such as the presence and absence of setae and subtle color differences. However, telling these apart in the field may be challenging even to an experienced researcher. Ticks are distributed throughout the world and are often found in close proximity to humans. Different species inhabit different environments, ultimately leading them to contain different pathogens. Furthermore, these ranges are rapidly expanding. So we are currently observing tick range expansion that is estimated at a staggering 46 kilometers per year northward for the black-legged tick. As ticks migrate to different territories, there may be opportunities for hybridization, which can add additional complications to taxonomy, as well as the presence of novel diseases. However, unaided migration is unlikely due to their small size and limited mobility. Therefore, ticks have to rely on other means for range expansion, such as humans and birds. It is estimated that between 50 and 175 million Exodes scapularis ticks are distributed across Canada by birds each spring. So a little uh, previous research that is important to my study. There was a previous study done at the Queen's University Biological Station in 2020, where ticks were collected from small rodents such as chipmunks and white-footed mice, and then sequenced at cytochrome oxidase 1 for genetic species identification. The cytochrome oxidase 1 gene is a highly conserved mitochondrial gene that is often used for species identification, such as in the Barcode of Life project. So this research found 67 Dermacanter variabilis ticks that only differed from the reference sequence by a few base pairs and found similar results for 14 Exodes scapularis ticks. However, there was a single sequence that did not conform to any known species on GenBank, but that was most similar to Exodes angustus. It differed by many base pairs and may provide evidence for a possible new species within the area. However, there are drawbacks to using cytochrome oxidase 1 as it is maternally inherited mitochondrial gene. It therefore cannot be used for population structure and hybridization studies. This research became the inspiration for my undergraduate thesis. Well, my undergraduate thesis focused on identifying and imaging ticks within Kingston, Ontario essentially attempting to find additional evidence for a possible new species within the area. However, due to the time constraints of an undergraduate thesis mixed with COVID restrictions during the height of the pandemic, I was only able to image and sequence a small subset of ticks that, which most likely did not reflect the true diversity within the area. Of these image ticks, I was able to find some differences, but these were quickly attributed to sex sexual dimorphism. This can be seen with here, where we have an exodus scapular female tick, and here with an Exodes scapularis male tick, and we are, see clear differences in feeding structure around the mouth and other locations, which is attributable to the differences found within the uh, PCA shown before. So with my current master's research, I hope to answer three questions. How much morphological and genetic variation exists within versus among species and sample site? How many genetically distinct species are present in the sample? And are there any genetic, genetically distinct populations within the same species? 
There are two main methods of tick collection. Uh, active collection, which can be seen on the left, where a researcher is actively searching for ticks utilizing the dragging technique, and passive collection, which can be seen on the right, where ticks are found on the body or, or, or another animal. Currently, we have roughly a thousand ticks collected between the years of 2016 and 2021 from about 20 locations across Eastern Canada, Eastern Ontario, sorry. So this is the distribution of some sample sites across Eastern Ontario, mainly ranging from Kingston to Ottawa. Because there are so many locations within the sample, they are grouped into three different categories representing differences in general location. Here we have the Kingston region, the Queen's University Biological Station within the middle, and the Ottawa region at the top. Within the study, dermacanter ticks were almost exclusively collected from the CUBE site and were not collected from other locations. So in total, I have imaged and landmarked 214 Exodes female, 154 Exodes male, 83 Dermacanter female, and 66 Dermacanter male ticks for a grand total of 517 specimens. Ticks were morphologically identified utilizing a handbook to the Ticks of Canada by Lindquist et al. They were then photographed utilizing a light microscope equipped with a camera and a total of 10 common dorsal and 15 common ventral landmarks were chosen for morphological comparison. Landmarks were chosen based on which aspects account for the most intra and interspecific variation and the resolution capabilities of the camera. Here is an example of the landmarks found on the dorsal and ventral aspects of an exoscapularis female tick. After landmarks have been selected, a Procrustes alignment is required for shape comparison. A Procrustes alignment allows you to look at differences in shape while controlling for other factors that impact these comparisons. To do this, a Procrustes alignment first translates the shapes, then rotates them to the same plane, and finally scales them to control for differences in size. The final alignment looks solely at differences in shape between selected landmarks. I conducted a Procrustes alignment on the common landmarks between ticks. So here we are able to see all of the selected landmarks before a Procrustes alignment has been conducted. So there is a lot of scatter and distribution within landmarks mainly attributed to tick location in the image, differences in size and rotation. And here are the same landmarks after a Procrustes alignment has been conducted. We are able to observe better grouping around single landmarks after controlling for translation, size, and rotation. So here we have the average locations of 10 common dorsal landmarks mapped onto the general body shape of a hard body tick. The theme found in the figure will be kept throughout the presentation where light red indicates specimens from the Exodes genus and blue from the Dermacanter genus. Furthermore, circles will represent female individuals and triangles males. So to look at variation within the data, multiple principal component analysis were used. Principal component analysis are a method of unsupervised machine learning where no prior knowledge on grouping is known. This method is a dimension reduction tool that looks for structure within the data and what variables account for the most variation between data points. It takes complex interactions across multiple dimensions and allows us to visualize them in two dimensions, ultimately making trends in the data easier to visualize. In other words, PCA is a tool for visualizing and exploring morphological vari variation. So this is a PCA for the dorsal landmarks of 503 exoded ticks. Some have to be excluded due to damage. Uh, as said before, open circles indicate female specimens while closed triangles indicate males. Blue indicates ticks that were morphologically identified as Exodes scapularis, while red indicates Dermacanter variabilis. So PC1 accounts for 85.39% of the variation, while PC2 accounts for 7.98%. We are able to see that the 10 dorsal landmarks distinguish between species and sex relatively well for female ticks, but there is some overlap for male Exodes and Dermacanter ticks. So these are the results of the 16 common ventral landmarks. The shapes and colors are the same as the previous plot. Here, PC1 accounts for 43.06% of the variation, while PC2 accounts for 32.28% of the variation. Here we can see better grouping by species for Dermacanter, except the one female individual that seems to be in the middle of all four groups. 
We are also able to see a fairly large difference between Ixodes male and female ticks. To investigate if there are any observable differences within individuals, PCAs were conducted within the same species and grouped by location. Within this PCA, we have Ixodes scapularis female ticks on the left and Ixodes scapularis male ticks on the right. Red points indicate individuals sampled from lower latitudes, blue from middle, and green from upper. We can see some subtle grouping within both plots, which is highly significant for female ticks, but not significant for males. The same PCA was conducted for the ventral landmarks, where left indicates exodus scapularis female and right male. Here we are able to see some more distinguished grouping for female and some more subtle grouping for males, where there are significant differences for both female and male exodus ticks. The geographical differences in morphology is something that I'm looking into currently. So in order to determine if these landmarks are suitable to distinguish between species and sex, linear discriminant analysis was used. A linear discriminant analysis is comparable to a PCA where it looks at differences between groups. However, unlike principal component analysis, which maximizes the variation between groups, Linear discriminant analysis utilizes predetermined groups to classify individuals to those groups based on the data. Uh, these predetermined groups are what allows this analysis to be known as supervised machine learning. For this study, the predetermined groups are species and sex, which I assign. Um, and we are attempting to look at how well the chosen landmarks are able to distinguish between these groups. This is a confusion matrix, which compares how well the selected landmarks grouped individuals. Rows indicate the groups that I assigned the individual ticks to, and columns indicate the predicted classification based on dorsal landmarks. We can see that the selected landmark group in, grouped individuals fairly well, except for five individuals identified to be exodus scapularis male, but were predicted to be dermacanthar males. And here we can see the dorsal images of the five males. And based on ornamentation, we can see that they are in fact exodus scapularis male ticks. So this classification is surprising, but the, uh, when we look into the genetic data, these might actually represent different species. So here we have the same confusion matrix for the ventral landmarks. These landmarks also distinguish between species and sex fairly well, except for one dermacanthar female predicted to be an exodus scapularis male which is extremely surprising, and two dermacanthar males predicted to be females. Here we have the images of dermacanthar males predicted to be females, and here is the dermacanthar female predicted to be an exodus male. It may seem extremely difficult to tell these apart. However, the differences become more apparent once you see them dorsally, where you can see clear distinguishes between ornamentation, where we have two dermacanthar males at the top and a dermacanthar female at the bottom. So following morphological analysis, the next step is to acquire genetic data to complement the morphological analysis. To do this, all tick DNA was extracted and is currently being prepared for sequencing using the geno genotype in thousands by sequencing, otherwise known as GTSeq protocol. GTSeq is a method that uses next generation sequencing of multiplex PCR products in a single Illumina high seq lane. GTSeq is a relatively novel technology that has many benefits over traditional sequencing methods. It allows for large numbers of loci from across the genome. It is extremely robust to low DNA concentrations and quality that result from small arthropods like ticks. It is relatively cheap with an overall cost of less than $5 per sample. And the bioinformatic analysis needed to analyze the results is relatively simple. So for the genetics, I plan to finish up my lab work and then analyze the genotypes within structure and other programs in R to get a better idea of the level of population structure between locations. I will also generate similar PCAs for the genetic data and compare them to morphometric data to see if the observed morphometric variation is similar to the genetic variation. So why is this relevant? So here we have, we see the distribution of some exodes ticks throughout the world. And this is the distribution of Lyme disease causing microbes. 
we can see that there are distributions overlap. Therefore, it is essential to know what species are present in different areas in order to create effective risk maps for various diseases. These re this research is an important step in creating these risk maps by identifying the species within Eastern Ontario and the morphological features that distinguish them. So for this uh, project, I would like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Rob Coletti, for his support and guidance throughout this project. I would also like to thank both my committee members, Dr. Steve Lohead and Paul Martin for their support. I would also like to thank Xin Ching Sun and the members of the Kaladi Lab with special thanks to Seema, Maria and Logan who have been a huge help throughout all aspects of the study. And here are my references. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Damien, for your presentation. Uh, we are going to move into uh, questions for Damien. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box or you can raise your hand icon or you can unmute and ask your question. Just scrolling through. So while we're waiting for the audience to warm up and ask a question, Damien, so after this project is done, what might be the next logical step for your next series of research if you were to continue on? I would definitely expand across uh, a greater area, uh, including southern areas southern to the border, possibly, because we know that uh, ticks are expanding at a pretty alarming rate. And with the introduction of ticks via birds and other mechanisms, it's really hard to know what, what ticks are present uh, or already here from before the migration. So I'd like to get a bigger sample size across uh, all of Ontario or possibly even larger to really see what uh, ticks are present and the microbes that might cause uh, infectious disease within the area. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Damien? Scrolling, seeing if anybody has their hands up. So while we're waiting, uh, again, uh, ticks aren't my area of expertise, but just looking at those photos, it's I find it challenged to the naked eye to look and, and see the difference. They look very similar. What are some of the techniques that you and your lab have done to help facilitate being able to recognize? Uh, experience really helps within with field work, but uh, there are clear distinguishing features between genuses where ornamentation such as uh, the shield will have a different color or um, the size between Dermacanter and Exodi species is pretty pretty large. But uh, definitely reading up within the handbook to the ticks of Canada is, is very helpful to distinguish between the genus. But when you get down to the species level, it's very, very difficult. You, uh, we get into areas such as location of CT or hairs, um, very subtle differences in color, which makes, uh, such as those that I sh uh, showed within the Exodes definis and Exodes scapularis ticks, and it becomes very difficult. Thank you. We actually have a question now in the chat box. Uh, the 46 miles northward, northward during how long? Is it per year? The question was. Yes, yes it's per year. Okay, and I have another question. Damien, can you show us the slide again of the derma center tick markings? Yeah, uh, the dermacanter tick markings, sure. Dermacanter would be... So these are the dermacanter dorsal aspects and these are the ventral. However, I don't have a slide with the actual landmarks for Dermacanter, but they're extremely similar to the landmarks found on the Exodes tick that I have, that I showed in the previous slide. Yeah, can, can you go back to the um, the, the uh, dorsal? I was trying to see, I, I don't know if it's just the lighting or camera, whether those two males on top, they don't seem to be exactly the same. Like if you look at the top, the uh, just the patterning, the, the way it comes together at the top is a little bit different. Yeah. But so, uh, is, that, is that actually, am I just seeing things from the, 
you know, the lighting or is there, are there differences in the, in the patterning there? Uh, there are subtle differences in color, but what, when comparing within the dermacancer genus, the, these are pretty typical. Like these are uh, from the ornamentation. I'd like to support it with the genetic data, but from the ornamentation, they are definitely male dermacanter variabilis ticks. Right. I guess my question is more about variation within that. I mean, because you're talking about potentially different species within a genus or just mm -hmm. just understanding variation in, in patterning in general. I'm just wondering how variable this, this is within the, the group. It, it is variable. And the landmarks that I have selected don't really look at, they can't look at ornamentation, which is a, is a drawback, but, but hopefully subtle differences in uh, shape are, are seen and we can uh, see which ones actually might be hybrids or a uh, new species. Thank you. Uh, we do have some questions now popping up in the chat box. So the, your next question is, any plans for longitudinal data collection to look at morphological changes over time within regions? Yes, uh, currently we have data from 2016 to 2021, which, it, which also might uh, account for some variation seen. We also have differences between collection methods within the summer. So some in April, some in September, which also might account for some of the variation seen uh, with, within the sites. Um, but uh, I would definitely like to keep sampling ticks over a longer period of time to see if uh, there are differences maybe be before they're established in the location between or until they are uh, completely established. So that would be very interesting, yes. Thank you. Your next question is, what inspired you to focus your research on ticks? They are extremely bad here in Kingston. So like you can't go to a park or a provincial park or go on a hike without the fear of getting some ticks on you. And I know that the, the diseases that they cause are, are pretty horrific. And uh, this led me to, to really want to dive into uh, what makes them different, which diseases are associated with which species, and to hopefully uh, have an impact on uh, studies within this area. Thank you. Uh, your next question, Damien, could your tools be applicable to clinical labs in order to identify tick species rapidly, i.e. to decide if post-exposure prophylaxis could be given? Yeah, that, that, that is what I'm really hoping for, is to uh, get these um, morphological distinctions in, into uh, hospital settings where uh, doctors and other uh, uh, healthcare professionals can easily distinguish between species and then prescribe the correct uh, mit mitigation techniques or medicine to prevent the overprescription when it is not necessarily a problem and really catch these diseases before they become extremely bad. Thank you. And uh, there's a final, just a comment. Fantastic job, Damien. It was really nice to see the progress you've made on your project to date. Um, we do have time for a couple more questions. If anybody does have any questions for Damien, feel free to raise your icon or unmute and ask your question. Oh, go ahead, Maddie. Hi, Damien. I, uh, I asked the question about the kind of like evolution over time. Uh, just to follow up, I have no idea how quickly ticks evolve. Um, how long would you expect it to take to see any kind of like meaningful change in morphology over time within within like a typical like a single geographic region? Um, that is a very good question. Um, the generation time is typically a year uh, for them to uh, molt, three years for them to molt into adults. So we can see some pretty rapid evolution there with, with, that, with that short generation time. And it'd be very interesting to see differences associated with like host association within areas where uh, different populations will actually morphologically change to be associated with different hosts. So that, that might be an area to look into as well. But uh, I think, yeah, it, it could be extremely rapid. 
Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Could some morphology variations be due to environmental questions or food abundance, temperature, or exposure to pesticides? Yeah, that's definitely something to look into. I know I said previously that differences in host preference usually account for differences in uh, the feeding structures and other areas. Um, so yeah, that, that definitely could be, be something very interesting to look into. Also, the uh, pesticides, I don't know what impact they have on, on ticks currently, but, but that would also be very interesting to look into. Thank you. These are great questions. We do have time for one or two additional questions before we wrap things up and I let you know what's going on tomorrow. So don't be shy. Feel free to unmic and ask a question. Just doing a quick check. Well, I think that's it for today for questions. Thank you so much, Damien, for uh, your presentation today. I'm just going to share my screen and just set this up. So hopefully you can see that. Again, thank you, Damien, uh, for taking the time to do your presentation on your master's thesis um, and for answering all our questions. Just to remind everybody, we are back tomorrow. Uh, on Tuesday, May 17th, at the same time, 12 o'clock, noon Eastern Standard Time, we have Dr. Rachel Wombolt and Dr. Nancy Wang, who are presenting on the topic of long-term outcomes of Lyme carditis. It's an update uh, for 2022. This was what Dr. Adrian Baranchek had mentioned when he presented uh, not too long ago. Also a reminder to take part in our challenge, wear green or wear a green face mask, take a photo and share it with us to help spread awareness of Lyme disease. You can even send your photos in that you draw or are creative if you don't want to send your personal photos in. Any, any entries received will be automatically entered into a draw for one of uh, $25 Starbucks Ghee gift cards. The live draw will take place on our last day of our presentations on May 31st, and you can send your entries to clydern at gmail.com. Um, I'm just looking to see just a final comment. Great job and a very cool topic. Thank you again, everybody, for attending. Thank you again, Damien, for presenting. I hope everybody has a great rest Veronica, of the day. Veronica. Yes? I just see um, someone has their hand up there. Oh, do they? Thanks, Rob. Uh, let me just take a look. I will stop sharing so I can see. Perfect. M. Kelly, you are up. Yes. Uh, I just that, wanted to thank you for your great work, and I, I was wondering, uh, I would love to be there tomorrow for the car, the carditis talk, uh, but I unfortunately won't be able to. Uh, are, is anything uh, available retrospectively, or is, is it, you said everything was... Um, um, Recorded, absolutely, recorded, right. yes. So we do, we are posting uh, behind our members portal all of the presentations. So all 18 are posted within 24 to 48 hours um, afterwards, depending on my availability of my IT uh, person here. So if you don't have access yet to the Clydern members website, you can send me an email or you can send it to Clydern at gmail.com letting me know that you do need access. I will send you the instructions of how to get an, a user account and then you can go ahead and watch uh, the presentations. I do want to say that right now our member portal, if you do have access today, our member portal is down. We're just getting IT. Some update happened this weekend and it bumped out our ability to get in, but it, it will be up and running very quickly. But yeah, just send me or the Clyder an email and we'll get you up so you can watch the presentations. Great. Thank you. No problem. Thank you again. Again, thank you, Damien, for your presentation. And we hope to catch you tomorrow and the rest of the week. We do have presentations on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday this week. Then after the long weekend, we have three presentations next week and then two the following week. So take care, everybody, and hope you have a great day.